Welcome to the Leo Training Podcast with Joe DeLeo. You'll hear in-depth interviews and tips from world-class athletes, coaches, and industry-leading experts to help you train smarter and improve at what you love to do. Train smarter, get stronger, move better, race faster. Here's your host, Joe DeLeo. Hey everybody, we are back with another episode. Today's guest is Eric Hinman. Eric has a remarkable story to share with you. He began his professional career as an insurance salesman, then moved into mobile technology, and eventually became a gym owner. Along his way, Eric has been a CrossFit athlete, a two-time Ironman Kona finisher, and a Lululemon ambassador, as well as the co-founder of Urban Life Athletics. You'll learn that with hard work, perseverance, and intelligent training, anything is possible, whether in business or sport. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode. Eric, thanks for coming on the podcast today. Uh, really looking forward to having you on and sharing your, your experiences uh, and expertise as, uh, as a triathlete and uh, Ironman Kona competitor and now uh, CrossFit Games competitor. Thanks for having me, Joe. You just made it sound like I like to get my heart rate up. <laughs> I know you like to uh, to train smart and hard, and uh, I think everybody will definitely benefit from a lot of your uh, your experience and advice. So, yeah, for sure. So before we get into the, the fun stuff and, and talk about uh, training and everything, take a couple minutes and uh, let's let's hear your story, your background. You've got a pretty unique path. Uh, into, um, you know, endurance sports and strength and conditioning. Um, definitely something kind of the non-traditional route, but I think something that uh, a lot of people could relate to. Sure. So I'll go back to high school. I played three sports in high school, uh, basketball, track, and cross country. I was always a decent runner and enjoyed endurance running. Um, I didn't have a lot of the tools back then that I have now, such as the knowledge of heart rate training and becoming a fat adapted athlete, things I wish I knew back then that I think would have made me even more competitive. Uh, but I was always a competitive person. Uh, and I think that stems back to, you know, just the way I was brought up and not so much competitive against other people, more just competitive with myself, always looking to, to self improve, uh, and better myself and better whatever I'm doing. And, uh, so after college, or after high school, I went to SUNY Geneseo near Rochester. I played one year of basketball, and by played, I mean I sat the bench, which wasn't fun, but, you know, it made me want to get better and do other things. So I focused on studies and did really well in college. Uh, my major was business management, and I graduated in 2002, I believe with a 3.6 or 3.7 average, and I went on into the insurance industry, uh, property and casualty insurance. My father was the president of a small insurance company in Parrish, New York, for a number of years, and I grew up learning from him, working for him, and uh, he gave me an opportunity out of college to essentially run my own business within his business. So I took him up on it, and uh, from 2002 until about 2005, um, I drove all around New York State soliciting uh, niche businesses, campgrounds, marinas, hotels and motels selling property and casualty insurance. So, you know, that taught me a lot about sales, a lot about business and a lot about insurance. It was really learning on the go and um, learning how to develop relationships with people, which is valuable in anything that you do. So uh, in 2005, I had built up a large enough book of business that I was able to go off on my own and start my own insurance agency and uh, licensed some other brokers underneath me that sold insurance through me. And then also I became licensed with a number of other insurance carriers. So I steadily grew that business uh, and was actively involved in the day-to-day -day until about 2009. And in 2009, I was able to hire someone who uh, took me out of the day-to-day -day operations and started doing a lot of the customer service for me. Uh, up until that point, I was the person that was just glued to their BlackBerry. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it was eye-opening that, hey, you know, you can delegate things and people can do things even better than you can. So 
um, that really shed light on what it's like to be an entrepreneur and start a business, but then uh, build the business, put the pieces in place so that you can then create more white space to tackle the next uh, the next thing. So in 2009, a friend and neighbor uh, was in New York City with me. I was with my girlfriend. He was with his wife, and we were walking around in Soho in Manhattan, and we were talking about mobile applications, and we were both obsessed with our iPhones and just saw that mobile apps was going to be just this next revolution of the internet. So in walking around Soho, we couldn't figure out where everything was, and we had this uh, map called a red map, and we said, why don't we build this on the iPhone? That can be our uh, entrance into the app market. So we developed uh, by outsourcing uh, development to a team in New York City, an app called Soho in My Pocket. And it was essentially a really early like Yelp or Foursquare where it basically showed everything around you. And then our business model was teaming up with the various venues, retailers in Soho, hotels, and having them offer location-based deals and discounts. Um, it was a ton of fun. We met a ton of people. We learned a ton about mobile apps, but from a revenue and profitability standpoint, it was unsuccessful. Uh, but fortunately it got us into the app market really early and, um, we transitioned into a service-based company. We started taking on clients and building apps for them instead of focusing on our own products. Um, we set up shop in the Tech Garden in Syracuse, New York, and we met this team called Rounded, uh, which was a group of incredibly bright um, developers and engineers and designers uh, that were really the missing piece uh, for us to really scale and grow our business and, and take on major clients. So in 2012, after working with them, dating for about a year, just kind of outsourcing work to each other, we merged the two companies together, and that's when we really started firing on all cylinders and started building complex mobile applications and web applications um, for B2C clients, B2B clients, and uh, just you know really started to grow the team. Um, so the insurance business was an autopilot, and now I'm involved in this software company called Rounded. <laughs> uh, and my role was really business development at that point, seeking new clients and um, conceptualizing apps, which was just an absolute ton of fun. Also, around the same time, let's say 2010, I had started getting back into physical fitness, uh, was training with a personal trainer, and uh, got into decent shape, um, started mountain biking from mountain biking that led me into road biking, road biking. I met some friends that had these really fancy aerodynamic tri bikes that got me intrigued about triathlon. So I signed up for my first sprint triathlon in, in 2010. And, uh, you know, I had a running background, biking came naturally swimming. I had no clue how to do. And, <laughs> Uh, I joined the gym in Syracuse about a month before the race, swam every single day just to get comfortable in the pool, did a couple open water swims, and then did my first triathlon in August of 2010 in Casanova. Um, it was really choppy. I almost drowned in the swim, but I made it through. I passed half the field on the bike and then uh, almost everybody else in the run. Um, so nice. it was a ton of fun. I did well, but at the same time, it uh, being competitive, there was more to be desired. I knew I could really improve my results. So that got me excited about training for triathlon. Um, so uh, I started uh, entering other triathlons, other sprint triathlons. The following year, I entered an Olympic triathlon and the half Ironman. And at this point, I was still, you know, very casual to the sport. I would say I was more exercising rather than training. Um, I didn't really understand, you know, why I was running a certain day, why I was biking a certain day, um, you know, what that bike meant, what that swim meant, what that run meant. And it wasn't until I met a local triathlete named Mike Corona, who was beating me in all of these races, and I didn't understand why, because I looked the part having done a lot of CrossFit leading up to it and 
Um, but he, you know, he would just, he would always beat me at every single race. And he taught me that there's a big difference between exercising and training, that every workout has a purpose if you want to compete at an elite level at anything. So I ended up hiring him as a coach and he really took me to the next level of understanding how to train for triathlon. So I did my first half Ironman in 2011 called Eagle Man in Cambridge, Maryland. It was super hot. Uh, and at the end of the race, I did great on the, I, well, I never have done great in a swim, but I made it through the swim in that race. I did great on the bike. And then I remember I went out at like a 645 pace on the run, <laughs> half, half marathon, which I had no business at that time going out that kind of, that, that kind of pace. And I remember a lot of the spectators when I was going out from the bike, they're like, wow, nice pace, impressive. They didn't see me two miles down the road where I just absolutely bonked. <laughs> and from about three miles on, my pace was at 930 and above because I went out <laughs> way too fast. Just had no clue how to pace it at the time. Um, so I finished the race, and my girlfriend, Jill, was at the end. And it took me about 45 minutes standing underneath a fire hose, cooling off before I finally was able to um, talk again and uh, act co uh, coherently. <laughs> and I, I told her after that race that I would never sign up for another one. But it's amazing how the sport sucks you in. About two hours later, I told her I was going to compete in a full Ironman. So <laughs> in that two-hour period, I, I did a complete 180. Um, so the following year, I signed up for a full Ironman, uh, Lake Placid, 2012. And I was coached by Mike the entire time. And uh, at Lake Placid, I finished my first Ironman in 10.01, and I was one spot and one minute away qualifying from the World Championships in Kona, Hawaii. Uh, the, I didn't know it at the time, but the person who took the final slot in my age group, 30 to 34 at the time, he passed me at mile 25, and I, I saw his age on his leg. I had nothing left in the tank, so there's looking back, there was absolutely nothing I could do. But you know, when I found that out, I was like, "Well, guess I got to sign up for another Ironman the next year." <laughs> so continued continued training under Mike, and really had a tremendous progress from 2012 to 2013. And in 2013, I was able to qualify for Kona, and then also in 2014. So uh, just a ton of fun with triathlon. Met uh, a ton of great people and learned so much. Um, so 2014, uh, I was still training CrossFit at the time. Actually, this is, uh, late 2013. I was still training, uh, at a local gym doing CrossFit workouts just cause I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the community aspect of it. Very similar to triathlon and, uh, several of the trainers approached me and said that they were interested in starting uh, their own CrossFit gym. So <clears throat> I decided to uh, make a, an investment in them with several other partners. And we ended up opening a CrossFit gym in 2013 called Urban Life CrossFit. And uh, fast forward to today, that now is uh, about an 8,500 square foot facility called Urban Life Athletics. And it's a CrossFit gym, an indoor cycling studio, and a hit studio. Uh, all located in a large industrial warehouse, and uh, the business has grown tremendously since the start. And <clears throat> my role shifted from being involved at Rounded to being sucked into urban life. And uh, over the last year, that's really been my focus. I ended up selling my shares in Rounded uh, just so I could focus more of my time on uh, building the brand and building the business at Urban Life. So. That's a, that's a quick summary from 2002 <laughs> until 2016. That's awesome, man. I mean, that's an incredible journey. Uh, just the, the, um, progressing from, you know, insurance to, uh, triathlon and mobile technology. And then now, you know, full on entrepreneur in the, in the health and fitness industry. Uh, so big, you know, big shift in terms of what you started out doing out of college to what you're doing today. Um, and there's a couple of things that you, uh, you mentioned there opening up, um, but quick question for you. Is there, was there anything that kind of sparked or was a catalyst 
uh, that made you want to start getting back into fitness, um, back, you know, around, I guess, 2008, 2009, when you started with a personal trainer? Yeah, two things. I mean, I was starting to, to get out of shape and <clears throat> I wanted to get back in shape. That was probably the main goal. But after getting back into shape and I signed up for the Utica Boilermaker, which is a 15K race. And, you know, I'd been training with the personal trainer for about two years prior to that and gotten back into decent looking shape. Uh, but wasn't doing a ton of endurance based cardio work. I was mainly just doing CrossFit, high intensity workouts and weight training. So I signed up for that race and just got absolutely smoked for how I thought I should be able to do. So I realized there was a big difference between looking fit and being fit. Um, and my competitive drive kicked in and that's really what led to, you know, this whole, um, fitness lifestyle. Um, was just wanting to be fit again, wanting to be competitive with myself and just, you know, tap every last ounce of what I thought I could achieve. Um, and then also with a lot of the training, I, I saw, you know, relationships that blossomed, um, new relationships for business, new personal relationships. I started learning a ton of stuff and just the mental clarity that comes with exercise and eating healthy. So, you know, it's just, uh, it's a whole bunch of different things that click when, you know, you're living a healthy lifestyle. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, um, that's something you and I have done some, some sessions together in the pool or open water swims. And I remember you, you've mentioned a couple of times, but even then you said it to me, it's a, it's a lifestyle. And you've, you've yep. mentioned that several times so far in, uh, in this, uh, in this interview. And, what do you mean by that? What, why is it a lifestyle and it's not just something that you, you know, you go and show up at the gym and you do for 45 minutes? How do you differentiate between, you know, exercise and, and lifestyle and why is that important? Yeah, I think it's important because you need to enjoy what you're doing. For so many people, I feel like exercise is something that they just want to check off their list. So, you know, they said they did it because they think they're supposed to do it and then they can, you know, consume more calories in the day. <laughs> right. <laughs> When it's a lifestyle, it's something that you look forward to doing every single day. Um, and, and it doesn't have to be going to the gym. It can be playing tennis. It can be going for hikes. It's, there's a whole host of things that, you know, uh, can be considered living a healthy, active lifestyle. And it's just finding those things that you really enjoy and also finding people you enjoy doing it with. You know, I think the one great thing that triathlon, CrossFit, um, these boutique fitness studios have done is, they've allowed people to take the headphones off and interact with the people around them and develop relationships and, you know, push each other and have a ton of fun, and develop a community. So I think that's, uh, that's really important to me is that community aspect of fitness and that lifestyle aspect of fitness, rather than just going to the gym, throwing some headphones on and hopping on a treadmill for 40 minutes. So, you know, you can just check it off your list. I love it, man. Yeah, that's great. The the community aspect, uh, social interaction with other people and, and you know, uh, the constant self-improvement and being around others. That's, that's huge. And it makes it more enjoyable and fun for sure. Definitely. So, um, can you talk a little bit more about heart rate training and then also what it means to be, what is a fat adapted athlete and what that means? Sure. Um, so heart rate training, <clears throat> this goes back to uh, exercising versus training. So when I was exercising, I really had no clue, you know, why I was going out for a 45-minute run. I was just going out for 45 minutes, and at the end of that 45-minute run, I wanted to feel like I, you know, was fatigued and accomplished something. So I would just go out pretty much as hard as I could for 45 minutes. Um and when you start heart rate training, so the key to endurance sports, it's kind of twofold. It's building durability and it's uh, developing an aerobic engine. And the way you develop an aerobic engine is you do the majority of your training at an aerobic heart rate, which for me, and um, so I'm 35 now, it's a heart rate of anywhere between 130 and 135. And that will teach your body to burn fat for fuel as opposed to burning uh, glycogen and carbs, which is incredibly important when you're endurance racing. 
um, because you can, you know, essentially go forever. Your fat fuel tank is so much higher than your carb and glycogen fuel tank. Um, so when I started training with Mike, I was, you know, going out for a 45 minute run at, let's say a seven minute per mile pace. And, you know, I certainly felt like I was achieving a lot, but my heart rate was anywhere from 150 to 160 for all of those runs. So he told me, Hey, you got to slow down to speed up. And I didn't quite get that. And it took him a good three months to finally get me to do it. And, uh, he basically said, Eric, you know, I'm going to stop coaching you. If you continue to run over a 140 heart rate, I need to put a 140 heart rate cap on every single one of your runs. Um, <laughs> and he goes, what that's going to do is allow you to run longer and more frequently, which is going to build an aerobic engine and it's going to build durability for you. So finally I, I listened and I started slowing down and I, you know, in the first two or three months, I was like, Mike, I don't really feel like I'm getting any benefit out of this. I could talk to someone and it just doesn't feel like I'm going hard. And my pace was, let's say maybe an 815 per mile at that 135 heart rate. So after three months, I started seeing my pace come down. It was an eight minute per mile pace at a 135 heart rate. Six months in, it was a 740 pace at a 135 heart rate. A year in, I was running a 715 at a 135 heart rate. Fast forward to 2014, 2015, I was running a 635 to 640 pace at a 130 heart rate. Um, and that was all from doing that endurance training and then eating a high fat diet. It was doing very, very little, um, threshold training, some on the bike, not a ton on the run <clears throat> and some tempo training as I would get closer to my key races, tempo training, meaning, you know, essentially my race pace for a half Ironman or a full Ironman. But, um, it was really amazing. It, it just, it took time, but. Um, gradually my heart rate would stay the same and my pace would go down. And, you know, when I was going out and just beating myself up all the time, running at that 150 to 160 heart rate, you know, I couldn't really run long and I couldn't run frequently because I was going so hard and I wasn't getting any benefit from it. I was just staying at that basically same fitness level. So it was really just training with the heart rate that made me understand that there's a difference between exercising and training and there's, you know, a right way to train and a wrong way to train. So, um, heart rate was key. And then the high fat diet. Um, if you want to teach your body to burn fat for fuel, you need to eat fat for fuel. So, um, you know, I would wake up and have a bulletproof coffee, which is uh, coffee with grass fed butter and MCT oil. Um, I would have uh, vegetables at every single meal, avocado at every meal, nuts and seeds, and then lean protein. Um, just very few carbs. Uh, if and when I did have carbs, they were usually timed either during or after uh, a workout. And generally, uh, like a tough session, something that was, you know, hard where I was burning through glycogen and carbs. Um, and in doing that, I was, you know, I could hop on my bike on the trainer and go for three to four hours with just basically water. And, you know, maybe I would have one, um, nut butter based bar while I was on the bike and I wouldn't bonk. I'd be able to, you know, go in a, at an aerobic car rate right for that entire time without, uh, without really fatiguing. Wow. So you, you touched on a lot of really important stuff there. I mean, not just the, the heart rate training, but also the diet, right? Because if you're not eating well, you're not going to be recovering. You're not going to be building on top of the, the foundation that you're laying forth during the training sessions. So, um, how, a couple questions. One is, um, how did you set that heart rate? Was that, um, was that, from the, the Mathetone heart rate 180 minus age and you guys adjusted that over time a little bit or, um, cause you're 35. So you said you did some training runs at like 150 to 160, but, uh, on the bike or the run or even swimming, you would be 130 to 135. So how did you settle on that? Yeah, it was based off of the Mathetone, um, method. That's, you know, it came down to 130 to 140 was kind of my target range. Um, also it, it came down to doing some threshold tests. So my, my threshold heart rate 
was 175 to 180. Um, so some of it was also based off that, what my max heart rate was in doing a threshold ride. I'm, I'm not an athlete that can get his heart rate up to, you know, 200. So, um, my aerobic heart rate thresh, uh, zone was a little lower than maybe some other athletes might be. Um, <clears throat> so that's how we determined it. the 155 to 160. That's what I was doing prior to being coached by Mike. The 130 to 135 is what I did when I was being coached by Mike. Um, I would do some of my threshold training between 160 and 165, and then I would do most of my tempo training between 145 and 150, um, because that's what I would race a half Ironman at. Uh, and then my threshold was, it, over time, it actually, my heart rate for threshold sunk a little bit because um, I was so fat adapted and, and so aerobic that it was difficult to... Um, it was difficult to maintain a higher heart rate for a long period of time just because of the power output at 160 compared to 170. Um, it was difficult to get my power to where it needed to be at 170. <clears throat> wow. Wow. Um, so it was it difficult um, to kind of, you know, Mike sat you down a little bit and said, all right, I need you to slow down with the heart rate. It, one, I'm, it takes some trust, right, from between the athlete and the coach to do that. But there's a lot of patience involved because, like you said, you're not seeing necessarily that immediate satisfaction of results, um, you know, from training, right? So it took, you said, three months, and then after six months, your your running pace started to come down, and, and then a year later, and then two years later. But it's not that sort of overnight, you know, success or that overnight satisfaction of uh, hitting a PR, can you talk a little bit about that? <clears throat> yeah, it uh, it was very frustrating in the beginning because it just didn't feel like I was doing anything compared to how I was training. And w when I tell other athletes this, I get the same feedback too. Is they're like, I was walking half the time at a 130 heart rate, Eric. I'm not doing anything. And I go, yes, you are. You're doing something. Believe me. Just give it time. It works. But it, it really is just executing. And you have to trust the person and you have to trust the process. Um, that's what it comes down to. And it's difficult for people because you don't, you know, in the beginning feel like you're doing work, but you know, um, you know, in 2014, whenever Mike would send me a, a run that had me in the one fifties for heart rate, I dreaded it <laughs> because my pace was so fast at that, that it hurt so much. So, you know, it, it really does work. You just, you need to trust it. You need to give it time. And usually after three to four months, you'll start seeing results. You give it a year, you're going to see tremendous results. Awesome. So, so definitely stick with it, be patient and don't uh, get discouraged if you're not seeing some results immediately because it takes time. You got to trust the process. And I mean, that just, you know, one of the, <clears throat> one of the key things that Mike always told me was an Ironman race is not limited by fitness. Um, you know, you have a ton of people out there that may look the part, but it's limited by durability and the person's aerobic engine. And those are the two things that you need to focus on for endurance training. If you're doing a sprint triathlon, then it's going to be a very different training protocol. You're going to be doing, you know, a lot of high intensity stuff and, um, you know, more short intervals. But for endurance training, it's really not fitness. It's durability and having an aerobic engine. Yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit more. Um why is durability so important, right? So you you spend a, a tremendous amount of time. You've done the endurance training. Now you're more focused on, um, you know, competing at the CrossFit Games, um, doing CrossFit-type workouts. Um, but all the while you were doing the, the Ironman training for triathlon, you were also still going to CrossFit. So you're getting a lot of strength and conditioning work in and really working on the durability. Um, how did that help? Why was that important in terms of, you know, the crossover and making you like a really good, complete athlete? Uh, I mean, I think the big thing things that you wouldn't otherwise strengthen just swimming, biking and running. So, you know, doing squats and deadlifts and, you know, functional movements. Um, you know, I was never injured doing any type of training. The only injuries came from bike crashes. Um, so I think CrossFit helped tremendously in that. And also since I did not do a lot of intensity 
with the triathlon training, you know, CrossFit did bring some of that intensity. So I did get some metabolic conditioning from it. So, um, you know, while some Ironman athletes aren't able to race well in sprint and Olympic distance triathlons because they only really have one speed, uh, I was able to also do well in the shorter distance triathlons, sprints and Olympic distance. And I think a lot of it was from, you know, that uh, metabolic conditioning and anaerobic conditioning that I got from doing the CrossFit workouts. Um, you know, you have to be careful though with it. You know, I certainly had times where I was overtraining. Um, and my, Mike, you know, you would have me always back off the CrossFit workouts and any leg workouts as we got closer to my main race for the year. So, you know, CrossFit would generally be from November until April. I could pretty much do as much CrossFit as I wanted. And then in April, I'd start backing off. And then in mid May, I would really back off on CrossFit. You know, I might only go one or two days a week and I would skip any type of heavy leg days, um, or any kind of high volume leg days just because I needed to hit, uh, key session, key sessions, running and biking. And on the weekends, I needed to hit those long sessions. That's certainly much more important if you want to do well in an Ironman than, you know, hitting a, a five minute CrossFit workout. Right. So that's, that's huge. You, what you're really talking about there is, you know, uh, it comes down to prioritizing your training along with what your goals are for, uh, for, you know, what you're pursuing currently. And for you, that was at the time qualifying and competing at the, uh, Kona Ironman world championships. Definitely. Yeah. Cause in 2012, when I did well at Lake Placid, I, I was still doing a lot of CrossFit and I was also heavier. I was probably 175. Um, and just had a lot of upper body muscle, which isn't necessary for triathlon. And then in 2014, I was probably 165, less upper body muscle, less strength, but I was able to excel, um, in running. I think they say for every pound, it's, uh, two seconds per mile on the run. So if you drop 10 pounds, that's, 20 seconds per mile on the run that you can speed up, which over 26 miles, that's quite a bit of time. Wow. Wow. And you saw a pretty big jump, I'm guessing, from that year where you were 175 to 165 the following year. I did. I did. I think I ran a 325-ish marathon in 2012. And then I believe in 2014 at Lake Placid, I ran a three. 308, 310, something like that. And I mean, a lot of it was just having less weight, carrying less weight up top. Wow. Incredible. So what are, what are, what's your training looking like these days? Um, so you're, you're not, uh, training full bore for, for Ironman, but, um, you mentioned you got a, you got a Peloton bike, so you're still cycling quite actively and you're, you're definitely, uh, doing a lot of the, um, CrossFit, uh, workouts, uh, throughout the week. So what are your, you know, what are your current goals? What are you pursuing in terms of, uh, competition or events? Yeah. So up until, uh, April of last year, so almost a year now, I was training still for triathlon. And then in April of last year through June, I was trying to figure out what I really wanted to do. Did I want to compete again at Lake Placid or did I want to focus more on CrossFit? I was really enjoying working out at, uh, my home gym and the community. And, you know, f for me, like I said, triathlon is always about self-improvement. And I got to a point where it was really just going through the motions and I was just staying at the same fitness level and wasn't really willing to make the two sacrifices to continue to gain speed, which were losing more weight, which meant less strength training, losing more muscle and swimming more often, which Swimming was never something that I truly enjoyed. Um, <laughs> so uh, in April, like I made the decision to see how far I could take CrossFit, and I I started uh, dabbling in Olympic lifting and strength training, and um, going to hit hit the CrossFit workouts four to five days a week, and that's what I've been doing for the past year now. Um, and I just want to see what my limitations are now with with strength training. Um, I wish I did a little reversal. I wish I did CrossFit in my 20s and, and triathlon in my 30s because I certainly don't recover nearly as fast as I used to. And, and CrossFit recovery is key. Um, 
but it, it's been fun. I mean, I've, I've seen tremendous progress in gaining strength. Um, I've gotten my uh, anaerobic engine back, so now I'm able to you know go hard in these four to eight minute workouts. And it's been really fun Olympic lifting, just learning uh, snatch and, and clean and jerk um, and working on technique, very similar to the technique you would work on, like swimming or, or biking. So that's been really fun. I still bike a lot. I have not been swimming at all, <laughs> and I still run occasionally. But biking is mainly the cardio conditioning that I continue to do. And then uh, I usually hit uh, about an hour of CrossFit every day, and that can range from Olympic lifting, strength training in a CrossFit workout, or just um, several CrossFit workouts in a day. So right now my volume is I'll usually spend about 60 to 90 minutes biking and then 45 to 60 minutes doing either strength training or or CrossFit training. Is that – Six days a week, you're doing two sessions a day? Yeah, usually I, I tend to work out seven days a week. <laughs> Recovery's never been a strong point of mine. But two of those days are more just cardio-based where I'm just hopping on the bike and, you know, pedaling for 60 to 90 minutes with, you know, no real goal in mind, just uh, having fun, spinning my legs out. Nice. Are you still <laughs> monitoring heart rate on the bike when you're, uh, when you're doing those sessions or are you just kind of just doing it by feel at this point? I am monitoring my heart rate still. I was doing it on field for a while, but started to notice, you know, I was losing my aerobic engine. So over the last month or so, I've started to implement the heart rate training back in just to, you know, make sure that I'm in that uh, appropriate heart rate zone. Because now with the CrossFit workouts, I'm getting a lot of the metabolic conditioning. So I don't really need that on the bike, but I want to keep my engine because CrossFit does, you need durability and you need endurance for some of the workouts. So uh, in doing the bike, it's low impact and I'm able to keep that aerobic engine that I have, which is, um, that's really the strong point I have in CrossFit right now. So I don't want to lose that. Um, I need to continue to build strength to be competitive. That's where I lack right now. <laughs> that's great. And I, I really, I like how you've, you've made sure, uh, you've made sure that you've maintained sort of balance between the two, right? Cause you have on one side, the pure endurance, right. Where you're doing, uh, coming from the Ironman, you know, longer, longer type events, longer training sessions. And then you have much shorter, higher in- intensity strength training workouts, um, at the, at the gym. And, uh, you've, you know, you stay true to your roots. You've made sure that you've monitored and went back and you're staying in that heart rate zone to, to, uh, and they, they feed each other, right. To the higher intensity metabolic conditioning helps, you know, your, your speed on the bike and then the endurance work on the bike helps you to maintain throughout the entire, uh, longer sessions in the gym. They do. Yeah. They complement each other incredibly well. Um, yeah, yeah, I really think the balance between the two is kind of the perfect, you know, if you want to be fit and you want to look fit, that's the way to do it is, you know, having a portion of your day that's hit type training and then a portion of your day that is just aerobic endurance type training. And, you know, I, I look fit, I feel fit. Um, but, you know, if you want to be the, the best in the world at one or the other, then you need, need to focus on one or the other. So, so that's a great point. So question for you is um, one, you've done, you know, several years of, you know, a lot of lower intensity, higher volume endurance training, especially with the heart rate. So very methodical, very scientific approach to it. Do you think you would have responded as well to the CrossFit training if you didn't have that sort of foundation underneath? Meaning, do you think you would have been more like less durable? You may have gotten injured more if you didn't have all that aerobic conditioning? Definitely. Um, So in CrossFit, I've always been able to excel at any workout that is over eight minutes. So eight minutes to, you know, let's say 30 minutes. Generally, the the CrossFit workouts don't last longer than that. Um, I can excel at those because, you know, very durable from the high repetition of running and biking. Um, And also the mindset, you know, to me, a 30 minute workout is nothing when you're You've done five and six hour bike rides where <laughs> most CrossFit athletes, they see a 30 minute workout and it's the end of the world. Um, 
But I mean, the, the tough part is are those five minute workouts because I'm not used to going hard right out of the gate. I have so many years of, you know, pacing training that, you know, I, the mindset to go hard out of the gate isn't something that is innately built into me. So that, that's been the most difficult part is just having the mindset to, you know, okay, it's a four minute workout. Don't pace it. Just go as hard as you can and kind of hope you don't fatigue at the three minute mark. <laughs> um, and I'm finally starting to overcome that. Uh, but, it, but it took a good five to six months coming off of all of the triathlon training to even have the mindset to be able to, to do that and to not pace it, just to go hard right out of the gate and, you know, trust that you'll be able to go that four or five minutes at the same pace. Yeah, it's it's a big shift. It's a totally different animal from going, you know, anything 30, 60 or multiple hours to you're talking, okay, basically I want you to just put the gas pedal down to the floor as hard as you can in, you know, three to five minutes. And at the end of it, you're, the tank's empty. Yep. It's totally different. Um, you're, constantly running through a mental checklist where you're doing the longer events and, and managing energy and nutrition and, and all those types of things. And, and then, uh, you know, for the, for the short event, it's just, all right, let's kind of see where, where the chips fall today and, and drop the hammer. Yeah. So very different because you're burning through glycogen and doing that. Um, you know, I was always taught in the Ironman racing not to burn matches. You, you only have so many matches before you run out and you're going to bonk. And, you know, it's funny with the CrossFit training, you know, whereas I can go three or four hours on a, on a bike ride, you know, if I really hit two or three CrossFit workouts that are five minute each really hard, I literally can't do anything after that. I'm completely spent because you burn through the matches that you have. Um, and that's the difference between, you know, burning through the, the carbs and glycogen versus you just burning fat, which you have a much larger fuel tank. Right. Right. And then I think that's uh, what you're touching on. It to me is really in particular or in particularly interesting because that's sort of the, the time range, time range for, for rowing races. Right. So you, you know, depending on the event in rowing, uh, whether you're in an eight all the way up to a, you know, a single small boat, you're looking at anywhere from, uh, you know, sub 520 for a men's eight to, um, you know, 730s, eight minutes, depending on conditions. Uh, and it's, that's that high anaerobic, you know, work. But these are also athletes like an Ironman, like a triathlete that is doing a ton of lower intensity endurance type work throughout the year to build that aerobic engine. Um, and the, the, one of the key crossovers there is that you have, the regatta and you might be racing three, possibly four times in the seven days or less. And you're going all out for all of those events. So it's, it's exactly like what you're talking about there. You're, you're dropping the hammer for five minutes, uh, maybe, you know, two or three times in a day. And you probably have to take a few days off to recover or do some lower intensity work to just spin out your legs. Yep. Awesome. So let's, uh, on that note, let's, let's kind of shift into recovery a little bit. And what are, what are some practices? What are some things you do to help with recovery, whether it's at the end of a session in the, uh, cool down, um, you know, nutrition, um, you know, what are some of, uh, Eric Hinman's best practices and tips? Yeah. Um, I mean the two that work, well, I would say the three that work the best for me. Um, I do at least one massage every week. Uh, only because I don't spend the time stretching and foam rolling. So, you know, that one or two massages a week are really what I use for just rehabbing and, and staying, not rehabbing, but um, just keeping everything fluid and preventative. Uh, the other is I try to eat a lot of anti-inflammatory foods, especially with the CrossFit training where, you know, you're, you're constantly ripping uh, muscle. So I eat... Uh, I put a ton of ginger and smoothies and blueberries and spinach and turmeric, um, ginger turmeric teas. So a lot of anti-inflammatory foods. Um, I eat a high vegetable diet that tends to make me recover faster. And, uh, you know, post-workout, I always try to get meals in, in that same window of time for what the workout length was. So, you know, if it was an hour workout, then within that hour following, I, I try to get uh, some protein and, and carbs back in. Um, sleep, 
tremendously important. I try to sleep at least seven and a half to eight hours every single night. And, um, I try to get deep sleep as well. Um, <clears throat> I think sleep is incredibly important. It's amazing how, you know, you can hit it really hard one day, feel awful at night. And then the next morning you're, you feel great just because you got so much deep sleep. That was especially true of the triathlon training where, you know, I'd have a five or six hour training day and be completely fatigued. But if I was able to get eight or nine hours of sleep that night, I would wake up the next day and, you know, almost feel like I could do it again. Uh, so sleep tremendously important. Um, and then I, I like to do the infrared sauna one or two days a week just to get, uh, stimulate circulation, get the blood moving again. Um, that's helped me tremendously. And I sit very, very infrequently. I normally am walking or standing. Um, I try to do everything I can to keep moving throughout the day just to keep blood flowing. So I don't get stiff. That's, that's a great one. I love that. Um, because, you know, we're in such a, a time period right now where majority of people are glued to a desk or a chair for eight to 10 hours a day and just not, not moving period. Just yeah. sitting. I um, feel awful when I fly just sitting in the seat on the plane. Um, I feel so off, uh, just because I'm not used to sitting for usually any longer than 20 or 30 minutes at a time. Um, you know, if I'm, if I'm doing work, I'm standing, doing work on my laptop. So just very, very rarely sitting. No, that's, that's great. Uh, I hope everybody out there listening is, uh, is going to take some value from, uh, from what you just shared and put that into practice. Um, so we're, we're kind of approaching an hour. So I'll, uh, I'll start winding down and start asking you some, some questions, uh, that I ask each listener. And uh, feel free to go into, you know, as much uh, detail and depth as you want. So first one is, what advice would you give yourself um, if you go back in time, talk to yourself 10 years ago, knowing what you know now, your experiences, your knowledge, if you could uh, talk to yourself 10 years ago when you were 25, what would you say to Eric Hinman when he was 25? Uh, I would have done CrossFit then and triathlon now. <laughs> Tell of both of them. <laughs> um, I, I would say the biggest thing when I was 25 was, um, you know, follow your passion. So this, this goes with everything. Um, and don't be a to-do list. So, you know, I've learned really over the last five years that, you know, you can follow your passions. And if you follow your passions, then, you know, money will follow. Um, and then also <clears throat> it's important to, not just be a to-do list. So not be reactive all the time, you know, to others and answering emails. It's important that you have your own white space to do things that are most purposeful to you. And, you know, you need to figure out who you are, uh, what your purpose is in life, what you can be the best at, what gets you excited every single day, and then make sure, you know, a large portion of your day is spent doing that, working towards achieving whatever the goal that is for you. So that, that's what I would have said, you know, to 25 year old Eric is, you know, what is your purpose in life? What do you think you can be the best at? What gets you super excited every single day? And how can you make sure that you're spending every single day doing things that align with that purpose and, and whatever your goals may be? That's awesome, man. That's, that's wonderful advice. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, what is your favorite, we go about this two ways. So what's your favorite strength training exercise? And then do you have a, I guess a favorite, you know, a training session, like a, a workout that you do? Yeah. My, my favorite strength training session right now is probably a squat clean, which <laughs> if you asked me that maybe six months ago, I would have said that's my least favorite, but I've seen tremendous progress in a lot of the explosive and Olympic lifts. So I've really been enjoying, um, squat cleans, cleaning, clean and jerk. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, the one that I want to focus the most on over the next six months, six to 12 months is the snatch. I still have not develop the appropriate mobility and technique for that exercise. It's a very complicated <clears throat> movement and I'm excited to, you know, really master that. Uh, what was the second question, Joe? Um, your, your favorite strength training exercise. And then do you have a favorite like workout or training session that you, 
that you kind of go to that you really enjoy doing? So something for, you know, 45 to 60 minutes or longer. Um, well, lately I've really enjoyed riding my Peloton bike that I just got. Um, so for those unfamiliar, Peloton is a studio in New York City and they sell, um, they sell indoor bikes for people to use at home and you can live stream the rides that they're doing in New York City. But you can also uh, ride in any uh, ride that they had previously recorded. And there's a leaderboard both in the live rides and in any of the rides that they've recorded in the past. And you can compete in real time on that leaderboard. So it, it reminds me of my days cycling outside and picking up uh, King of the Mountain segments on Strava. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like that, but doing it, you know, indoors in your home, in your, in your own home gym. So I've really enjoyed that lately. Uh, my favorite CrossFit workout, I love doing EMOMs, um, every minute on the minute type workouts, just because that way it's forcing you to compete against yourself. Um, so I'll always try and up rep schemes. I might do a 20 minute EMOM where I do, uh, 18 burpees on minute one and then try to row 18 to 20 calories on minute two and just keep doing that for 20 minutes. Um, any kind of EMOM workout where it really pushes me both strength wise and cardio wise. I, I love those workouts and it's just a great way to, you know, challenge yourself. It's, you don't have to go against anyone. You just, uh, you're going against the clock. Okay. Yeah, I love that you've you said that several times, and it's it's become very clear over uh, you know the last hour that you really enjoy just the the process, the evolution of the the self improvement, right? And it's like, how far can I uh, can I expand my limits? What are my limits? Um, and that's what makes it enjoyable. And I, I can see, you know, I can see that uh, that's what makes you keep coming back for more. It is, yeah. I mean, it's it's. It's so easy to get down if you try to compare yourself to others in anything. So, you know, try to be the best version of yourself. Awesome, man. Wonderful. Um, okay, so we've kind of touched on this, but maybe if you could uh, be a little uh, more, I guess, simplified and in, in, uh, you've gone over your, your training, how it's tra changed, but is there very simply – how ha is it different 10 years ago compared to today? You, I guess you would say you're, you train now versus exercise. I guess that would be it, right? That would be the big difference okay. um, is training versus exercising. <clears throat> you know, in my, and even going back to high school, I didn't understand, you know, why I was doing things. I didn't understand that they had, you know, everything has a purpose. <clears throat> so and now I understand that, if you want to compete at a high level in anything that there's a purpose for doing every single session and you need to understand what that purpose is and doing that, that session. And you need to, you know, figure out what your goal is. If your goal is just to be fit, then, you know, it's not necessary to, to train doing some of this stuff. But, you know, if you want to be a, an elite triathlete or if you want to be competitive in CrossFit, then there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. You know, you could do all the volume in the world, but be doing it the wrong way and not really get anywhere. So you want to, you know, you certainly want to train hard, but more importantly, you want to train smart. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So what's one thing that, uh, younger athletes or maybe in particular high school athletes should be doing more of, uh, to complement their, their training and health? Um, I mean, eating a healthy diet, I, I didn't have the knowledge when I was in high school about eating a healthy diet. So I think it's incredibly important to, you know, tap every last ounce of your potential, um, to eat healthy. Um, you know, for me, that means a high vegetable diet, um, <clears throat> lean proteins, you know, some healthy fats, certainly don't be afraid of fats, avocados and nuts and seeds. Um, so I think that's incredibly important. And then just make sure that you understand why you're doing everything that you're doing in training because there should be a purpose to all of that. Um, I didn't know that in, in high school when I was training. I didn't understand heart rate training. I, I didn't really know why I was doing everything. So, you know, it, it's okay to, to question um, authority and, and look up, 
you know, what other people are doing. I've always been a big believer that if you want to be the best in the world at something, then see what the best in the world are doing. Um, and the beautiful thing is you can do that now with the internet. You can find out what most people are, are doing. So figure out, you know, what you want to do, who you want to be like, what you want to achieve, and then see what they're doing and try and follow their principles. I'm, I'm a big believer in following those that have already done it. Um, and that, you know, self experiment. Yeah, I love the the curiosity and the educational component that you're that you're that's kind of underlying everything you just said, and and don't be afraid to uh, experiment or or question uh, what you're being told to do, um, because understanding the the purpose uh, and the the value of the intended training session is probably just as important as the execution. Because if you don't Definitely. know why you're, you're doing it, then you know, it's hard to follow through and have that discipline. Yep. Awesome. Uh, okay. Last question. Um, what's one book, uh, everybody should read. Oh, one book that everyone should read. Um, one of my favorites is, um, seven habits of highly successful people. That's an awesome book. Um, What's the other one? It's uh, Dale Carnegie. How to how to gain friends and influence people. I might I might be screwing up the order of oh, the world. Uh, is that Napoleon Hill? Uh, it might be. I thought it was Dale. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. No, no. How to, I, I how to win you're... friends and influence people? Something like that. I nice. love that book. It just okay. uh, you know it talks all about how to develop relationships and developing relationships is so important in anything that you do, um, for, you know, both learning and then also for getting ahead in life. Awesome, man. Great words of wisdom and stuff. Um, we are, uh, we're just under an hour now, so I'll wrap things up, but why don't you, uh, why don't you stay on the line? Let me give you a proper goodbye and stuff. And, uh, I'll be sure to, uh, share all this uh, and publish it and let you know when we get it out live. Sounds great. Ton of fun, Joe. Thanks for listening to the Leo Training Podcast. Subscribe and get even more expert training tips at www.leotraining.io.